Now, we're starting the show today. We're talking about coronavirus vaccine. Uh, it's being developed by Oxford University and it is showing promising signs. It's just in the first phase of testing. Well, the initial trials found that the vaccine is safe to administer. It induces the desired immune response and uh, the science so far says no serious side effects. From the, le from the leading... Uh, Oxford University research team. Uh, let's go now. We can establish a link to Professor Sarah Gilbert um, to tell us more about this. How excited are you by this, uh, Professor Gilbert? Well, we're very pleased to see the, the publication of our first clinical trial. It's a really important milestone in the vaccine development. It's doing what we expected. Uh, there aren't any big surprises. This is working as we'd hoped, but that's really good news. It's Will this be a one-size-fits-all vaccine? We don't know that yet. So we know about other vaccines that often in older people, they don't give such strong immune responses or those immune responses don't last as long. Uh, and that's another thing that we'll be looking at in the next phase of our trials. We're already starting to immunise people in older age groups. So this first report is on the vaccine studied in people between the ages of 50, 18 to 55. And now we're vaccinating people in two older age groups, uh, 56 to 69 years and then over 70 years. And we'll be looking at the same things. We'll be looking at the reaction to vaccination, which is actually often less in older people than in younger people. And we'll be looking at the immune responses, but that can be less as well. So it may mean that older people need to have a higher dose or possibly extra doses to get them the same level of immunity. And how long, um, Professor, are you hoping that the vaccine will give people immunity? Is it a one-off vaccine? Is it something perhaps where you'd have to have a booster every year? Well, that's another thing that we'll be looking at as we follow our volunteers that we vaccinated starting from April. We'll be looking at them at six months after vaccination and a year after vaccination and then continuing to to follow them for a longer period of time. We know that for other vaccines made in the same way, we get very good maintenance of immunity a year after vaccination. Um, that's in young adults. So we'll be looking at that. We don't think this is going to be once for life vaccination. But on the other hand, certainly in younger adults, you may not need a booster vaccine every year. It may be at longer intervals than that. Um, it's been described as, as a major breakthrough by the government, but often we hear about vaccines taking sometimes 10 years to trial before that they are manufactured for, for the general public. And I think, do you think that will be a concern for people, saying, well, this sounds wonderful, and of course we are desperate for a vaccine, but how safe is it? Is it being rushed through? So I think what people need to understand is that this isn't completely new vaccine. It's using a technology that we've used a lot before over many years. Uh, we've done a number of different clinical trials making vaccines against different diseases using the same approach. And in all of those clinical trials, we've shown that the vaccine is safe and it induces the right kind of immune response. So that's why we're not si surprised to see the results again now. So it's not something completely new that's not understood. It's a technology that's been used before and is well understood. Um, one of the reasons it often takes a long time is because vaccine manufacturers don't want to invest in manufacturing large amounts of vaccine and setting up manufacturing facilities to do that until they know that the vaccine's effective. But in a pandemic, we're not going to wait. Mm. So it's a financial risk. And the risk is to start manufacturing large amounts of the vaccine before we know for certain that it works and that it protects people. Because if it does protect people, we want to have vaccine ready to use. And that really saves a great deal of time in the, in the rollout of the vaccine without inducing, introducing any safety risks at all. Yeah, well, you know, you are the scientist. You develop um, all of this. And congratulations to you and the, the team at Oxford University for that. But who actually will end up producing this? I mean, I presume you've got to get into bed with a uh, pharmaceutical company. And the big question is, when would it be available? Yeah. So we're partnered with AstraZeneca, who have taken over the development and the manufacturing of this vaccine and are looking very carefully at distribution. So what they're doing is working with a number of vaccine manufacturers around the world uh, to make vaccine that can then be used in different parts of the world so that we don't have any shortage. And they're aiming to make a total of 2 billion doses over the next 18 months or so, which will really ensure we have a very good supply Incredible. of the vaccine. Incredible. Professor, something I've always wondered, and, and, and there you are, you are a professor of vaccinology at Oxford, and to develop this, you need volunteers, you, you need guinea pigs, as it were, you need more than guinea pigs, you need, you need real people. 
How, how do you actually approach a human being and say, we want to try something on you, um, it may have side effects, uh, we don't really know until uh, it develops within you? Well, obviously, we don't approach people directly. Um, we will have to go through a very uh, carefully controlled process. Everything that we're going to tell our volunteers, every written piece of information, every video that we're going to show them has to be approved by an ethics committee before they get to see it. Uh, and we have to make sure that we're telling them the right things that we should be telling them and are not making any false promises. So all of that um, participant information, as we call it, is approved by an ethics committee in advance. And then what we will do is use newsletters or um, advertise on our Facebook page or uh, on our website, inviting people to contact us to get information about the trial. And when they contact us, what they get is a package of information for them to review in their own time. And if they are interested in taking part, having reviewed the information, then they come back to us. And then they come for what's called a screening visit, where they don't have the vaccine, but they get the opportunity to talk more about the vaccine and what will happen in the trial. And they have some health checks to make sure that they will be eligible for that particular trial. It, it, it's Are you amazing. still looking for volunteers? At the moment, uh, we have almost all the volunteers that we need. We're still going to recruit a few volunteers in the older um, age groups. We have all the younger people that we need. And all of that recruitment is done through the Oxford Vaccine Group's website. It, it is amazing. It just amazes me that, you know, people will have different reasons for doing it. Um, but, but it is absolutely incredible that you get them. Uh, Professor, we'll leave it with you there. You're a very busy person. Um, you have things to do. We wish you every okay. success with your vaccine. I mean, the country's relying on you, so... Thank you, thank you. What a responsibility. Thank you very much indeed to you and your team. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, listening to all of that, Dr Philippa Kay, um, you know, these are the people and the, the science end that have to de de develop all this thing and then you have to deploy it. Absolutely, and we have to also explain it to people in a way that they can understand. So we've all heard about vaccines and you might vaccinate your children, but what actually is, is going on? And um, In this uh, trial, they're using technology that we have been using for a while, which is you take a virus and you make it completely inert to humans. So it cannot hurt you as a human, um, but That's it will... That's the bit, I think, that frightens people. Saying, so you're going to inject a little bit of COVID-19 into so me. So in this particular one, so we do use live vaccines, Vaccines that we make weaker, but here we're actually using a chimpanzee cold virus um, and we've added a little spike of protein from COVID onto it. That then goes into your system and your body recognises that spike, sort of like those shape sorter puzzles that your kids had. You know, you have to match the shape into the hole and that's the antibody that matches to the protein. And that's what seems to be happening here. But really excitingly, it's not just the antibody production. There's another kind part of the immune system called the T cells and that will treat the virus even when it's already in your cells it's out of your blood it's in your lungs and yeah. so to be able to mobilize both arms of your immune system is really encouraging so you're getting protection uh, and but, it's fighting infection but, but you see the thing is this never ends it develops uh, we do this we have COVID-19 taken care of mm. grace of god we do and then comes COVID-20 COVID-21 COVID-20 so both, you know, the, the, the virus develops and therefore the response to it has to develop as well. So we've had epidemics and pandemics always of mankind, you know, and you've heard of Spanish flu or swine flu, but we've had epidemics for ages. Um, and interestingly, the other trial, the imperial trial, is a new technology that means that we could potentially get uh, vaccines out much quicker. And what that does is it looks at a piece of code that tells your body to code that spike of protein, make it yourself, um, and then you produce an, an immune response to it for all that we would need to make that is the DNA code of the virus. And that's something yeah. that we can do really quickly. So in the future, we may be able to produce a vaccine in months as opposed right. to years yeah. and years. Well, let me ask you this, right? Um, if this turns out well, uh, I presume there would be a stampede of people uh, waiting to get this. And the professor was saying they're ordering millions of doses um, with all of this. Who should be treated first? So clinical need, who's going to do worst with it or who's going to spread it. So people, for example, in the shielding group um, or with chronic conditions would probably be eligible for it first, as long as it works in that group. And it may be that people whose immune systems are suppressed need a different treatment or a different vaccine. And then I would be looking at healthcare professionals and care home workers who have the ability to spread it around. And I would imagine that it's those groups first before the general population.
What about people who are very nervous about vaccinations or completely anti-vaccinations? Um, you know, how many of the population would we... What percentage of the population would we need to have this vaccine, to have that community... Immunity. Yes, so herd immunity. immunity. So a recent study said that about one in four people were, were very worried and would potentially not have the vaccine. Now, this is what herd immunity is. If I have COVID and I want to spread it to you and you and you, if you are immune because you've had the, vi the vaccine, the door is closed. Mm. It can't get to you and it can't get to you. And we would need about nine out of ten people to be vaccinated and have their doors closed for my virus not to be able to go anywhere. So we would be needing numbers higher than 75%, probably around 90%. We don't know the exact numbers yet. what would yet. you say to people who are watching who are nervous? You say, I'm just really nervous about vaccines. They're even nervous about having their children vaccinated about anything. So the first thing I always say to my patients is I vaccinated my own children without hesitation and that's about as good a recommendation as you can get. These things are safe. When we look at trials, there are two things that matter. The first is, does it work? And the second is, is it safe? And then everything in life and everything in medicine is the balance of risk versus benefit. So the risk of a sore red arm and a bit of a headache is far less than that 5% of people that are going to end up in serious trouble. So when you wake up today uh, on this uh, Tuesday morning and you see a headline like that, vaccine for Christmas, uh, scientists reveal their jab does work and could be ready in December. How excited does that make you? I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. hopeful. But I think it's important to be realistic. Not everybody in the population is going to be offered this by that point. I think it's probably more likely in the new year. But these are good, good signs so far. But in the meantime, stay safe, stay alert, socially distance. Wash your, Wash hands. your hands. Wash your hands. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You for